What is up, you guys? Welcome back to Otaku. Back again, doing more Tezuka Manga Contest reviews. Going to keep it real short if you don't know what the contest is. It is the 100th anniversary of this Tezuka Manga Contest, which allows people everywhere, worldwide, to submit your entries, your manga one-shots into this contest, ultimately for a chance of getting it reviewed by some of the greats. I'm talking author of Dragon Ball, One Piece, Blue Exorcist, My Hero, Slam Dunk, and then, of course, people at the Tezuka Productions itself. And then you get a fat cash prize and get to be serialized inside of Weekly Shonen Jump, which is fantastic. This week, we are not doing viewer submissions. Well, we kind of are. Kind of yes and no. Some yeah. one of you guys, and I, I'm not going to say the Twitter because your Twitter is on private, so I assume you don't want a shout out. Sent us a message on Twitter. It was like, hey, are you guys accept accepting recommendations? Like, these are my three favorite ones that I've read. And I was like, you know what, dude? You sent us three. We do three a week. It's like, I will read the three all in one go and we'll pick our favorite of the three. And here we are. So we're doing The Case of the Fallen Angel by NAF or NAF. I don't know if that's an abbreviation. Running Gun Rubia by Kanto. And then Hunger by Reitz. We're going to start off with The Case of the Fallen Angel. And I will be giving you guys a, um, was going to say quick summary, but not really because it's a detective one. Just like mm -hmm. uh, the last mystery one we did. It's buckle up. It's got to be uh, quite a bit. So first page we're joined we see a feather slowly falling from the sky a crying girl looks down from above and then as the feather touches the ground we see a uh, beautiful angel but uh dead on the ground with a whole bunch of blood all over it very graphic very graphic very graphic yeah. and the art style is fantastic as you'll see throughout the yes. whole thing we cut to some time later we see two members of a church at a detective's office requesting his help with his case the dead angel's name was alisa vonahue or Von vonahue she was found two weeks ago outside her apartment as if she had fallen from a great height. Because of this, the Department of Security has declined to take the case, stating that they believe it's either a suicide or an accident. Mother Celestial, which is the older lady from the church, says she doesn't believe this to be a suicide because she had promised previously to come to her birthday celebration, and Elisa has always been known to keep her word. Mother Celestial then insists that the detective take the priest Mars with him on the investigation. The detective tries to decline here, but Mother Celestial kind of insists, and he's like, oh, well, you're the paying customer. So, sure. And at this point, if you're like me, you're probably like, all right, easy, done. He's the guy that did it. The, the fucking yeah. guy who's going to have to go Not with too. the detective. Easily. I was kind of annoyed. I was like, oh, great. I'm going to have to sit through 50 pages of, oh, I wonder who did it, and then be act surprised when it's him. I don't know if I'm just, like, being, like, profile or what, but you see a guy with, like, the very thin the, the bags eyes, like, and everything. He's got like geen eyes. He does have geen yeah, eyes. Yeah, he does. He does. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, that's shady shit right there. I don't like that. So wait till you see. <laughs> so the two of them leave this and go to the scene of the crime. They investigate outside of Elisa's apartment. They talk to the man who first reported the body. He says he heard a sound like thump, thump, and then saw the body. And then uh, they ask if he saw anything else weird. And he's like, yeah, my son reported seeing a really large cat in the alley that day. And they're like, okay, thanks, dude. They then investigate her room, where we get a little bit of backstory on Mars, Elisa, and Mother Celestial. Both Elisa and Mars were abandoned by their parents due to a terrible superstition that comes with uh, blessed ones, which is the, you know, the people with the wings. Blessed ones will bring doom upon their creators, is that prophecy. So, uh, you know, their parents are their creators, so you don't want one. Do not want yeah. to have a blessed one. The two of them were taken in by the church and ended up becoming really close. Elisa was born with a weak constitution, and her wings only ended up increasing the burden on her body, so she was constantly in pain and would be like that forever unless she underwent a thing called the exaltation method, and which is an alchemy procedure that greatly enhances a blessed one's abilities. Unfortunately, it's way too expensive for most people, so it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing, but thanks to Mother Celestial's good works, they actually had an opportunity to have one of the church members undergo this exaltation method. But because of Elisa's weak body, there was a slim chance she wouldn't be able to survive the procedure. So, unfortunately, Mother Celestial chose Mars. Isn't that kind of a fucking dick move? Like, it, hey. Yeah. It seems <laughs> like it could have been simply solved by, like, asking. Like, hey, Elisa. Like, I know well, you're 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 going to live a horrible life. Yeah. If it's up to you. If you want to take the shot, go I, for it. I'm not so mad at the, the sister because I do think she made the best intention. But I'm like... Why you come into this place knowing there's at least two uh, blessed ones, and you're like, we only got one of those little special surgeries. Make them yeah. fight for it. Yeah. Like, I don't know. But you don't, Part know, of you me... don't know how it was acquired. Someone could have been like, That's true. you know, Mother Celestial, you did such a good job. It's like, we'll give you a free one. 
And then she's and like, then Ooh. They're like, oh, I have two. <laughs> yeah, whoops. Yeah, Shit. I could see that. So, but the guilt from this decision, as we talked about, is kind of fucked up. I uh, kind of drifted the three of them apart, and they haven't been as close ever since. Then we go back to the investigation, and they, they only end up finding a few points of interest in the apartment itself. You find out that she's been practicing uh, quotes every weekend, and she was practicing on the day she died. She's had multiple doctor appointments here and there, and then she had a flyer from a restaurant in Sector 6E. And 6E is a sector that the department, which is kind of like the police force, they no longer regulate. So powerful blessed ones have been gathered there to kind of slide under the radar. After the apartment, they go to the roof. They find bloodstains and some feathers there. The detective immediately just uses his 400 IQ and gives his initial theory. Like, yeah, I'm going to assume that she was practicing to fly up here. Hence the blood and the feather, the feathers. And that since suicide was unlikely, uh, it could be the cause of her death was just an unfortunate accident. They have led me for a loop yeah. up to this point. You think Gein's the one that killed her. You think Gein's going with her to fucking screw things up in, in investigation wise. And they're like, oh, she's probably just practicing, probably fell off. You know, it's like, God damn. Which then would be a just horrible way to go. Yeah. Right? It yeah. would be so sad. It's just like, yeah, I just want to learn to fly. And you just like, ooh, I went a ooh. little too far to the right. I, I know we're going to go towards discussion, but at this point, I just wanted to point out in my head, I'm starting to think, oh, is he going to have to figure a way to tell them that she didn't kill herself? Or is it going to be like she did kill herself and he's going to have to lay them like kind of give it to him soft. It's like, no, she must have fallen when she was practicing. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, I can't deal with that mental <laughs> stress for the rest of this. But that's where I was at right here. At so at this point, it's just a guess. All right. So we're, they yeah. go on to the doctor's office. Here they find out that the body had already been cremated due to religious reasons. That's what the church believes in doing. But they did kind of a light autopsy beforehand. And the only thing that the nurse thought was out of the ordinary was her wings. But she doesn't know why. She's just like, yeah, I thought the wings were a little weird. That's kind of it. The boys then go to talk to the doctor himself where he says that she would come in with injuries quite often. And she always had some sort of excuse. So he kind of knew something was up. And all he knows is she said she started making free lunches at a place in Sector 6E on the weekends. So the only place left to go is to Sector 6E itself. And the boys head to Eddie's Eatery, which is the restaurant that was the fl- that she had the flyer from in the apartment. We meet Eddie here, who is a giant weasel. Uh, literally, like not figuratively. <laughs> yeah. And they say they would like to ask him a few questions. He refuses. And then the two eventually get... Um, coerced outside and are politely asked to leave mars insists to the detective to please just let him handle this one where mars just decides he's gonna pick a fight with somebody so he punches the guy right in the face and sends him flying backwards here we see a young girl named zz come running out of nowhere insisting to the man that mars just punched to let her help him but she eventually gets dragged away and told to go away guy who just got punched then transforms into a warthog we're going off the rails here and then he fucking uppercuts Mars. It just absolutely uh, KOs him. Warthog. Yeah. Oh. I think it was a werewolf? Like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I feel dumb. See, that's where I first went to at first. Yeah. So, yeah, oh, you, at this point, I. as Josh just realized, uh, being blessed, like, so she, the girl that we're seeing our main character, she gets wings. But clearly that's not the case for everybody. You yep. can kind of be different sort of animals, which the wings seem pretty sweet to be blessed for now that you're looking back at. The detective steps in here and says that fighting isn't going to get them anywhere and then whispers to Mars to go tail the kid while he stalls these guys. Mars leaves and we see ZZ, the young girl, getting pulled away when all of a sudden we see a loud thump and a giant cat, uh, I would assume leopard, appears. Tabaxi. And... Tabaxi? Sure. We're going Skyrim references. The guy with uh, ZZ pulls out a knife and, like, attaches it to his knuckles. I uh, Pretty cool. I just came out of nowhere. And he mm-hmm. tries to hit the cat, but the cat just easily dodges each time, nimble like a cat. The cat goes in for a counter, but then Mars appears and kicks him in the face. Mars gets his ass handed to him pretty quickly here. And just when the cat man is about to go on the counterattack to both Mars and the guy guarding ZZ, the rest of the gang shows up and forces the cat to kind of dip out. He's way outnumbered at this point. Everyone reconvenes at Eddie's, where ZZ finally explains that she has the ability to enhance a blessed one's abilities. And once a day, she can temporarily boost a person's blessing, which is what she'd been doing with Elisa. And then because the cat found out about that, she is now after or he is now after ZZ. We go to a flashback here and we see Elisa training to fly in her apartment roof with ZZ. And that's when the cat attacks again. He quickly quarters Elisa and ZZ and basically like, hey, hand over the kid. 
Elisa refuses because she's a good person and goes to jump off the roof while holding ZZ, even though she was still just learning how to fly. So they begin to fly, and Elisa makes it just to the other side of the giant gorge we saw them in at the beginning, and she throws ZZ to safety before her. ZZ kind of blames herself for Elisa's death after this, but Mars reassures her, saying that it was always Elisa's dream to fly. So thanks to you, she was able to actually realize her dream. So you shouldn't feel so bad about it. Fuck me. They leave, and the detective tells Mars to go back to Eddie's and tell him that they're going to need their help to apprehend the cat. The detective then goes to the alleyway behind Elisa's apartment to look for clues. He explains that the cat likely used this alleyway as a means of escape. So he's looking for evidence of the cat's human form because if he is an exalted one as well, he should be able to transform from cat to human. Specifically because after Elisa died, a lot of people would have gathered. As we mentioned, the first guy actually literally heard the thump of her hitting the ground. So there was not much time in between that. So it would be quite hard for a two meter tall cat to hide in this city. The detective had asked his friends at the department if any matches for this cat that they've been looking for show up in the database. And that's when we learn about an old story that several years ago there was an alchemist who had gone missing after undergoing an experimental version of the exaltation method. Rumor has it he gained exceptional strength at the cost of his own sanity. His identity was never known, but it was said he had a terrible feline appearance. So pretty close, you know. Then we immediately cut. We do a quick knock knock. We are We see the detective is headed back to Dr. Lubin at his residence this time. The doctor asks how the investigation is going, and the detective says he's found very reliable witnesses and would like to know what he was doing yesterday. The doctor tries to play coy at this point, but the detective says, I think it's time for you to drop the charade, doctor. And here's where we get the big Sherlock reveal, because the detective continues that he believes the doctor pointed him towards Sector 6E to lure out what he sought. And four years ago, he disappeared after undergoing the exaltation method. He adopted a new identity and opened a clinic here because of the rumors about Sector 60 having a lot of strong, blessed people. Eventually, you found your chance due to Elisa's charity work and from her injuries, figured out that she was practicing flying. And you noticed that her wings were larger than usual on the days of the practice. And because that he was her doctor, he knew that her normal constitution prevented her from flying. So something was clearly up. And then all he had to do was just stalk Elisa to find out what was going on and wait for his chance. We go back to another flashback. We see that after Elisa threw ZZ to safety, she just barely didn't make it to the roof herself and was hanging onto the ledge. And she sees the cat, which we now know is the doctor, or we assume is the doctor, running and making a leap to make it to ZZ's room to go after her as well. But Elisa saw that, turned around, flew backwards to the cat, collided midair, sending them both falling straight to the ground. We go back to the investigation. The detective says the doctor only just returned to his clinic as well since he had heard the department won't investigate the case. And the cherry on the top, the detective had found bloodstained fingerprints in that alleyway. Fingerprints that match yours. The doctor finally says, very well. Even if he denies it, he doubts his friends outside the door would let him go. So he knows that the gang is out there. He says that he regretted what happened to Elisa. The detective is kind of, I don't know why he tells him this, but he's like, yeah, let's just see what he says. He says, do you know why Mother Celestial wanted me to look into Elisa's death? And he gives kind of a little bit of backstory on Elisa and Mother Celestial here. When Elisa was a kid, the three of them were very close. But after Mother Celestial chose Mars to undergo the exaltation method, their relation gradually faded. She was so determined to practice flying to the point of injuring herself because she wanted to be ready for Mother Celestial's birthday next week. Perhaps she was hoping that if she showed them that she could fly, their guilt would lessen and their relationship could go back to how it was before. Some sad shit. Here, the doctor tries to talk his way out of it, kind of doing a grandstand, saying if they could just use ZZ's powers, they could create an alternative to the exaltation method. But the detective isn't biting, and that's when ZZ kind of busts through the door. She's crying, and she screams that she will never help someone like you. Doctor says perfect timing. His counterpart, which kind of makes me think that he's kind of got like a dual personality thing going on, could barely stand more talking and then starts to transform to his cat form. The warthog guy, who is still boosted off of ZZ's power, says finally, and he gets ready to fight, but then Marsh grabs his shoulder and says, wait. And he says, please allow me. And ZZ comes over, grabs Marsh's arm, and says, kick his ass, which heavily implies ZZ has just boosted Marsh now. And now Marsh transforms, and we get to see he's like a snake, would you say? He's kind of like a reptilian of some sort. Like a lizard, dude. Yeah. Yeah. And we get a night. The, the, the doctor here, as they're both transforming, giving a stare down, he says, you know what, priest, whoever decided to call us blessed must have had a real twisted sense of humor. 
and bam, Mars punched the doctor right in the fucking noggin, and we cut to one week later. That's all we get to see of that. Fucking domed, bitch. Yep. We see. So we see the detective at Mother Celestial's birthday party, and here he steps outside to talk to Mars and ask what happened to the doctor. Mars says that Mother Celestial pulled a few strings to keep ZZ's powers a secret, so he doubts we'll ever see the doctor again. So he probably got fucked up in a big way. Mars asks, uh, by the way, is it true that there were actually no bloodstained fingerprints, which was the smoking gun the detective said he had? And the detective says, well, if there had been solid proof, I wouldn't have had to risk my life trying to get him to confess. So he went to do that on a gamble and was relying on Mars and the gang to intervene if it went wrong. And then the detective continues on. And speaking of the game, the gang, they wanted you to have this. And he pulls a photo from his jacket and says it's a copy of Mother Celestial's birthday present. We see Mars look at it and he immediately starts to cry. And then on the last page, we get a cool collage and then a long quote that we will read to finish it off. It says, in this profession, I have oft- I often have to look for evidence of a person's death. But every once in a while, I find a different kind of evidence. Evidence of a person's struggle in the relentless flow of life. Signs of their rebellion against hopelessness. Signs that they had lived. And then we see that the picture was of Elisa flying through the air, looking really happy. And that's the end of the manga. They had no right to make me cry. Dude, I seriously, that was so coaster. sad. I'm yeah, not even I mean, joking. I like that oof. that thing at the end. Oh my god, it made me feel things. I was like, why would they do that? That's not hey, cool. I almost had my uh my monthly reset where I watched a sad anime. Dude, I was like, <laughs> holy shit! And it's like this was the first one I read out of the three, and I'm like, oh my god. Same. Like, it was I read this so one at sad. the end, and I was just like, damn, dude. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's like the Debbie art's Downer. really good. The yeah. writing is really well done. Like the pacing is really good. And like there were multiple times that they kind of throw you off onto somebody else or like Josh thinking yeah. that it's just been a straight suicide or you think it's the guy yeah. that shows up at the very beginning. Well, they also had pictures at the beginning of Mars, uh, Elisa and uh, the mother. Mother Celestial. And they kind of made Mars look almost like a cat i couldn't tell what he was at first like he had like scales but that could have been like oh his fur so i was like oh fuck he is the cat like oh shit and then when the cat showed up mars had just ran after him uh ran after zz so i'm thinking oh shit mars is the cat the fucking detective just said hey cat go get them i know you were trying to get them earlier i was like oh fuck then mars showed up it wasn't the cat Uh, i was fucking i was stressed all over the place But it was very good. I liked it a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was like generally well done. And it's like, man, I would love to see the detective do more stuff. It's like I'm totally right. Like a whole detective series about this. No, I see. I disagree because if they're gonna make me fucking cry every time they put (laughs) it, I'm not cool with it. Because that was just like that was perfect. There wasn't anything over the top. It was totally logical. Like it was still. Like the world building wasn't egregious. Like I didn't need to know any more. We got like the gist that we needed. Yeah, the Fuck world building me. was actually done really well. Now that yeah. you mention it, because it's like yeah. there wasn't ever like long paragraphs of stuff. It was just like, oh, it was like this, and it's like, oh, if you're exalted, you do this, and then you just see that a warthog guy exists, a cat guy exists, and exactly. Mars is a lizard or something at the end. Yep. So it's like they Yo. just kind of show you. They like they give you like, yeah, this is what happened. Like this is our backstory, and then they show you that these other types of it exist as well. Instead of just going yeah. like, oh yeah, they do also exist. You get to see that and infer. Yeah, the I, cat I guy reminds me of Rob Lucci. Oh yeah, totally, totally. But I, I see it like Sam said, it'd be like a one shot, and it would just be his like adventures in this like exalted world. And I don't know, man. Like I feel like it's gonna be like NCIS or something like that, or it's one of those cop shows. It's like oh, yeah, I'm you never fine know with what that. That'd be in on that day. That'd make some sick anime. It, it was would. really good. I really liked it. It's uh, yeah. I don't really have any complaints with that. I like the characters. No. They set up Mother Celestial to be kind of a badass, too. Yeah. Um, yeah, they did. Like, she's got some strings to pull. The detective's cool. Mars has his time to shine. I like everybody at Eddie's. Except we don't ever really get to see Eddie, except for after the first time we meet Eddie. Yeah, that's true. He I really would... was like, nah, I'm not doing any questions. I already said no. So it's like, yeah. Like, uh, but if this is like the first in the series, now Eddie and his that crew in six E are now like an available set of yeah. like hands of yeah. the underworld kind of thing. Would like so to I see like this that. expanded more. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it's like that's we're not saying that as in like a, oh, it wasn't expanded on, on enough in here. This was the full fifty five pages and it was fantastic. It was really yeah. really Yeah. Good. I just want to see more is what I mean. Like yeah, I just continuation. Give, give me an yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, I think uh, we've sucked that one off enough. As you know, we really like it. (laughs) So let's move on to the next one. That was The Case of the Fallen Angel by Naf. We're going to go on to Running Gun Rubia by Kanto. So go ahead, Jose. 
right, so first of all, I like the color page and everything already. Super oh, cool. So beautiful. So good. Uh, and yeah, and we start off like very interesting. It's an execution day. It's being held in the middle of a city and crowds are gathering. Someone's about to get hung. Immediately, we're uh, introduced to Rubia, who's a short-tempered ter- girl, and a little boy named Miro, uh, who is a shoe shiner, a newspaper boy, and, you know, just an android. They're kind of, like, talking about how cold it is, but he's an android, so he doesn't really need a coat, and he traded his coat for a little toy. They're just in the crowd at the moment, and they're there with their gun master, Demas. Which is pretty fucking cool. Gun Fu, hell yeah. Yeah, right? At first, I read Kung Fu, and I was like, no, that didn't look right, so I had to go back. I was ready but, for guy with gun. <laughs> guy with gun. Uh, but they they wake him up and they're just kind of causing a bigger commotion while he's there. But the real I like this little tidbit that they put, and I don't know if you guys saw it, but they did the little asterisk thingy, like mm-hmm. right when they introduce him, and it says that his hair is supposed to represent uh, a a revolver's hammer. That's super cool looking. Yeah. Well, I just like those little tidbits of information that they put on there. Um. But back to the story, uh, they cause a commotion, and the guy who's going to be executed finally walks up, and it's this handsome man with a scar on his face. Uh, he immediately references cactuses and how e- even things with, like, you know, rough around the edges can still produce something beautiful, and immediately starts screaming out, it wasn't me, it was the scorpion lady who set me up. Uh, the executioner and all the guards are like, nah, let's just put an end to him, bag him and drop him put the bag over his head, and they release the lever, which drops him. Uh, but to everyone's surprise, his head pops off, and he just slams on the floor. Um, everyone, of course, confused. They don't know what's up. Uh, a guard approaches what's the dismembered head, only to find Cactus that shoots out like a pin cushion. It shoots its uh, needles and pricks the nearby officers, knocking them all down. And uh, our trio is just kind of like, um, okay, that's weird. And then the body gets back up. Everyone's kind of freaked out. But it's all a, it's all a, a plan for uh, the accused named Jack to just pop his head out, and he quickly dips out. Immediately, Rubia runs after him, uh, still complaining about the cold, and the guards take aim. And Miro slices through them with his beam saber. I mean, whoever he fucking took that from is a loser. Lost. <laughs> <laughs> he sold a beam saber, or he traded a beam saber for a coat. How good was that fucking coat, my guy? Rubia mm-hmm. was saying it's pretty nice. So yeah, it was, it was a nice coat. Uh, but back to the whole uh, confrontation, uh, the gunfu master Demas comes back and he does something called a 12 gauge TA show, which is essentially like he just released a shotgun bullet spray at the at the guards, knocks them all out, and then it cuts back to Jack who's running away and bumps into this giant gnarly guard who's pretty much ready to kill him. And so he goes to attack him, but Rubia pushes him out of the way, saves him, and she confronts the big guard by, you know, showing off some magical power. But the big guard's like, oh, you're going to stand there and just give me a pose? Ha <laughs> you want to take some pictures? And he gets blasted in the face by her killer technique slingshot spark, which is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, knocks him out, and she releases his bonds, and he makes a quick little jab at saying, he's like, oh, my God, I'm so grateful I could kiss you. She punches him in the face. Um, immediately he's like, oh, he's like, sorry, you know, poor choice of words. And he immediately starts to tell her, he's like, oh, you got to believe me. I'm not, I'm innocent. I was framed by the scorpion lady. I, she killed my boss, wanted his money. I'm literally just a plant guy. She's like, I know you're innocent. It turns out your boss is actually alive. He's the one who actually hired us to come, uh, to come save you and gets interrupted by Mr. Demas, who's immediately like, hey, that's confidential. But anyways, we're mercs. We're sent to stop the lady. And that's pretty much where it ends. Yeah, it's a very short one. How many? It was like 20 pages? Yeah, 25. 25 pages. Um, and then at the end, the author does this little tidbit where he's like, had nothing to do. Uh, couldn't go outside. He's like, So I picked up some games and started studying Japanese and made a comic. Humble flex. Well, Humble everybody had plenty flex. of time Straight during up. the quarantine, so... Oh, yeah. yeah. I learned the fucking different language and then wrote a really well done manga. I mean, I think they just studied how it works and stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, as Josh kind of mentioned, the art was really good. It was really good. mm -hmm. It was like unique. It kind of gave me like mild fairy tale vibes, but not like full on. Like, I am not, it wouldn't, 
I wouldn't get the two confused, but it was like super stylized. I really liked it. Like really. Yeah, liked I, I, it. I liked it a lot too. Uh, all these mangas this week had really good art. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, they really did. Yeah. And I like that this one was really short, but it was still like. It kind of sets up the world. You kind of know that there's like executions that are still happening. So you kind of get a feel about that. You see the guards, the city guards, there's mercenaries. There's something going on behind the scene. There's powers Mm -hmm. and all that in like 25 pages, like like three main characters. I guess you could say four with Jack. They're all a lot of fun. I liked all of them. I would love to see more of them. And that was very short. And I was like, man, that was really good. Yeah. That felt like almost watching like a five or 10 minute episode or like the start of an episode. Yeah. At least. Yeah. And like the I, again back on the like the way it was animated or drawn, it kind of felt like almost three D at points. Like it was really weird. I don't I don't know if it was just me, but like I think some it's of the angles, the way they did some of it, like even when they dropped him and they showed the little like you know the extended lines kind of going as he's falling, show that yeah. he's uh got gaining velocity. But overall, I, I liked it. Short, sweet, to the point, and fun. So what was yeah. going to be their original plan? By the way, they just let him get hung. And then they're like, "Oh yeah, we're here to save you." Oh, yeah, right. Because he's it's, it's like, not what until if he, he didn't have out. the cactus bit planned out, and he's just fucking sitting there like dying? What if? What if? Maybe if, they um, do that scene from Pirates of the Caribbean, where <laughs> yeah, that's a possibility. <laughs> but it's like I don't know. Like they didn't they didn't move in at all. They did, they were just watching. I feel like it would be, you know, this guy's about to be hung. The boss has hired them to save him, and he's like, "Look." He didn't do it. He's not that intelligent. He's going to do this stupid trick where he falls and his head's going to be a fucking cactus. Just 100% guarantee if he dies from it, you know, it kind of deserves it. But if he falls and there's a cactus, this is what I'm talking about. He, do- he has the same shtick. He doesn't do anything different. I wonder how he does that, though, because remember, his hands are tied behind his back. Yeah, so, he's a gardener, yes, man. Yes, that what, is Yeah, true. yeah, he is a plant dude, so he would know. But it's just like, can he just grow cactuses on the top of his head? That That's what I'm thinking, Like, because they all have superpowers of some sort, so I think that might be his superpower. He's he's dressed up in a nice, like, tux. He's gardening. It doesn't make sense. He's got to be able to, like, grow fucking cacti out of his head. Yeah, that's something, but it's there's, I'm nonetheless, sure there's I liked it. They yeah. were going to leave yeah. him to die. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> so they're like, <laughs> yeah. hey, mission failed, boss. Sorry, we'll still go get the scorpion lady. It's all good. Big rip. Okay, so that was Running Gun Rubia by Kanto. We're going to move into our last one, which is Hunger by Reitz. And go ahead, Josh. All right. So we start in a courtyard, and there's two kids practicing sword fighting. The younger brother, Lord Lori, defeats his older brother, Lord Namur. And, uh, After that, they kind of discuss how many wins they've had between each other. They've been fighting a bunch. They're offered some refreshments by the help, and Laurie identifies uh, the poison that his brother had placed on the rim of the glass, which are just like, what the fuck? Um, Apparently, this is a normal occurrence for the two of them to the point where the older brother has exhausted all of the regional poisons. The younger brother has built up immunities to these poisons, but he's still unable to avoid the current poison's paralysis effects. So he's taken away to his room by the the help. And they kind of talk to the brother saying, like, what the fuck is wrong with you? You can't be doing this to a child. He's like, "Uh, well, you know, he's just so ambitious. I just want to crush him, like, in a loving, weird way. You see that a shadowy figure had witnessed all this, though. And in the next panel, he's followed uh, Lord Laurie into the room that he's sleeping in. Uh, to which Lord Laurie wakes up and is basically like, who the fuck are you? Are you one of the maids? Like, did a priest send you? And he's holding um, pentel leaves. Uh, The child seems like he's unable to speak, and Lord Laurie is pretty much like, yeah, you're lost. I don't know who you are. Um, But he notices a scar on the kid's face, and he goes to touch the scar. The kid freaks out and immediately runs away. Uh, Another day later, and Laurie's um, walking around the, the grounds of the castle, I'm assuming, and he sees the kid meets up with him and says, hey, I've been trying to get a hold of you this whole time. Um, I'm going to give you this sand beetle dust. It'll help with the scar on your face. It'll help with like the inflammation and stuff. As this is all happening, I'm assuming it's Lori's mom walks up and she's got another kid in tow behind her who looks to be the exact same twin as this unnamed kid. Uh, she explains that one of the servants from the main house had uh, escaped and that they were these were the children of that those servants so they were kind of fighting over where to put them so they decided to to take them in temporarily and because Lori has no like kids his age to play with 
they decided, hey, you can play with Lori and he'll hang out with you. Um, Lori introduces himself to the kids and finds out that only one of them's been named. His name is Keddy, and the other twin has was never named by the mother. So being the nice guy Lori is, he decides to help say, hey, we'll I'll give you a name. Keddy is a type of grass that grows on the mountain, so why don't we give you uh, Kears, which is another type of mountain grass. Um, that's when we find out Kears is unable to speak for the most part and that the two twins are unable to read and write. So Lori offers to start helping, and then we get a montage cue with the, the backing track Live to Win in the background. It's super great. Really loved it. Um, we get that little hard cut in the middle of the uh, the montage, and Kenny begins to cry as he's remembering some stuff about his mother, why he was named, where he knew all this stuff. Then we get this fucking weird shit from Kears. He just walks up and identifies the type of emotion that Keddy's currently having as sadness, then gets in his face and then immediately tries to start crying and is just now like pouring tears like a fucking psycho. Go back to the montage a little bit and Lord Namor, the older brother, shows up and he basically says, hey, this is really weird that you've got cursed children in your company, you know, as a potential prince like, or as a prince. This is kind of like dumb, like you should get rid of them. Uh, Lori brushes this off and says, uh, these are just myths. Don't worry about it, guys. Just fuck him. Uh, so then we get some backstory on the Lord's brother, uh, the Lord brother's relationship. And basically, he's one of nine. Uh, he has a different mother than all of his other brothers. It seems like the king has like a brothel of wives and he's produced nine different children. And the way to become king after the king passes is essentially they kill each other. Uh, to earn that throne so a lot of them rely on assassination attempts and stuff like that to kind of weed out the herd so uh, at this time we realize that Kears is starting to get really good at reading um, and he's reading a book on cursed beings and stuff like that Kears, uh, Kears sees that Lori is whittling wood and he sees that and he's like teach me how to do that so he takes the two of them and starts teaching him how to whittle the wood and unfortunately Keddy cuts his hand across with the blade to which she starts bleeding. Lori goes and bandages the hand, and then Kears immediately says, hey, I finished the book I was reading. Can you give me the one in the next series? Lori runs over. He's like, hey, this is uh, the book on the Curse of Desire, so the next one's in the series is uh, should be in the library. I'll go grab that. So Lori gets to the library, and he starts opening the book, and it's called The Curse of Hunger, and he reads it, and he real realizes that the children in the diagram in the book have the same curse mark that Keddy and Kears have. So he starts to panic and it, he we get the uh, we start reading what it says and basically says that the um, the curse of hunger attaches to a host, mirroring it like a newborn and then feeding on their misfortune. When uh, the cursed being is no longer able to learn from the host, it will consume the host and then find a new host to continue the cycle. So Lori freaks out and he starts running back. All while this is happening, we get Kears saying, how much do you know? What do you know to Keddy? Keddy starts panicking, starts crying, saying you know, like he can still teach him. Um, and we get a giant shadow appear over Keddy. Um, everything goes to black. And as Lori walks in, he sees a mirror of himself. And Lori's freaking the fuck out. The uh, shadow basically says... I want you to, you found the book for me. I want you to teach me everything or teach me all you know. And Lori is shaking and hesitantly obliges and that's where we end. And holy fuck, that was fucking, whoever, I just want to say whoever sent these submissions loves the fuck out of like twists at the end and like <laughs> fucking reeling. So obviously this is supposed to be like, it's a one shot contest, you know? Yeah. But like, let's say this one continues on. Let's say he wants to do more of the story. Does it a go with like, you know, he tries to figure out a way to get rid of the curse being, or like they kind of like a demon curse bond thing going on. Kind of like, uh, oh. you know, uh, fucking Any like demon black clover. Black, black yeah. clover. Sorry. I was drawing a blank or, does this then curse being then make his way all the way up the family until he's eventually king? See, I See, that's had what I thought it was gonna do. That's why because he's the ninth, the the guy that mm -hmm. he attached to. So he there's eight other people at least in the prince line, prince princess line that are smarter and stronger than what he is. 
So I didn't get that at all. In the back of my head, I'm like, oh, this is fucked. But in my mind, I'm thinking this is kind of like a Brothers Grimm like fairy tale where mm. that's where it ends. But we have a bunch of other curses. I think they're on chapter nine or ten. Oh, what if all the other hunger. kids had curses? Interesting. Yeah, or something like that, or yeah. it's just the individual curse, like where it. Because I feel like the curses aren't unless it's like one of those. The curse was released by somebody, and yeah. now the whole world has all ten curses are out. Or it could be like in this time, here was the curse of desire and what it did to these I re- people. I really did get like the that. feeling, kind of like what you were originally saying, that this is kind of like this is the end. Like it's not meant yeah. to go past it. Like it is a true one shot. But I'm just saying hypothetically, Holy if it shit, did, if it did go That'd past that, it would be sweet. And I do think all the other curses go at it at the end. Yeah, I do. I would imagine at this point in time, the other princes or like you know the lineage line don't have curses because I think the older uh, brother said that the other slave children called them cursed children. So Mm. I assume that they don't have them. Yeah. So it seems like it was just, they were the slave or the, uh, the, the cursed children. And I, I, I find it hard pressed because yeah, again, everyone's too hoity toity to come over to see him. It's just more that wants to come by. So I think it's more the curse of hunger is going to start passing. It'll pass to Namor, and then it'll pass to the next kid or something That'd like that. Sweet. Namor, I'd be so down. That is that. mega fuck though. I didn't think yeah. about that at all. Until eventually, so. it's just like the clone of the king, and it's like, uh, well, yeah. every, everybody's fucked. Sorry. <laughs> That's it. I never even thought about that once. I was literally thinking like one shot fairy tale that was all like let's go. he takes over the king. But then he's the king, and then he could just demand everybody to bring him all of the knowledge he ever wants to know. And then what does he go from there? He Where's goes the to world. He goes to Zeus. <laughs> yeah, like he goes. <laughs> he goes up the line. I and I think at that point we just get to the king, and that's like game over. Yeah. Like you lose. And I think that would be full be metal. Wedding. Yeah, I. But that would be so cool. Yeah. I. Oh man. Yeah, it was good though. Good art, good story. Right. Um, I really do think it was a self-contained one shot, and I liked it. Yeah. it the, I did honestly. I was reading this manga, and I probably got three quarters of the way in. It's like, where are we going with this? Exactly. Like, I'm just watching these two, these two, three kids two, three hang kids. out, just and learn and have a good time. It's like, okay, yeah, this is wholesome, sure. So I think I read um, yours, Sam, first, and then I read mine, and then I read uh, Jose's, and I was like, exactly, like, where the fuck are we going? I hadn't established in the back of my head fucking twist the sky loves twist the <laughs> to us like this is insane except but, for running gun rubia <laughs> so, so. I, I mean there was the twist that the guy's not dead the guy didn't you know i, I wouldn't I say that was, was really a twist. One, yeah. but yeah but yeah I, oof. Uh, he, he needed something to kind of throw us off be like okay it's not another twist yeah, <laughs> yeah. the twist is there's no twist in running gun rubia <laughs> exactly <laughs> okay well let's uh, talk about the three that we've read and pick our winner for this week so we did The Case of the Fallen Angel by Naf, then we did Running Gun Rubia by Kanto, and then we did Hunger by Reitz. Uh, Josh, did you want to start us off? Which one did you like the most and why? I, I do not. I do not because I think these are all fucking fantastic. Um, I, I think as a one shot, I would give the win to The Case of the Fallen Angel. Like if that was just the, the storyline, that was it. That one won in my book. It had a complete, like, feels good story at the end, but also, like, what the fuck moments. But if I was going to say something that would continue on and have, like, an open world concept, I would probably go with Running Gun Rubia because I feel like that one just barely started, but it's got a huge world. I think Hunger was fantastic. And if it goes in the same direction as what you guys were saying, it's a strong contender um, with Running Gun Rubia in my mind. So I'm, like, really kind of fucking tossed up there. I'd like to know what you guys were thinking. I like the the the, the case of the fallen angel. More it's than just, running gun Rubia, I feel like that was right up your alley, Jose. Running gun Rubia is totally up my alley. It's something that I love and I like, but just a good detective story every now and then just sounds so good. And I love Batman. Okay, sure. <laughs> I sure. love Batman. That it's is just true. like there are times where Batman does like little detective ones, and like in his detective comic line, it's that's more along the the lines he would take with like the things he'd do talk to gordon and yeah. then just kind of like find people that know stuff and i was just like damn this is pretty good and not to mention the amount of roller coasters i i went on that one yeah 
Well, yeah. I mean, as has been said multiple times, this one was kind of unique because it's not just like with viewer submissions, it's kind of random as to the quality and how long and all that stuff. This was like someone reached out to us and like, hey, these are my three favorite ones. So like this is clearly somebody found their favorite ones. Like I would love for you guys to read it and know what you think. So they were already kind of going into it. It's like, okay, these three are probably going to be pretty good. So that's the situation that we end up in. We get Run Again Rubia, which is a great open world one, but it's very short. We get Hunger, which is re- kind of a dark one twist at the end, that is, which yeah. is really good. And then Case of the Fallen Angel is fantastic all the way through. A nice detective story, which I feel like is one we haven't really gotten so far in the competition. Yeah. So for my winner, I would, too, pick the Case of the Fallen Angel. So Josh's vote doesn't matter because two out of three. I would say, yeah, I, I'm fine with either at that point. It's It's really rough, but yeah. GG. Okay, well, congrats to Naf. You're going to be our winner, The Case of the Fallen Angel. Fantastic job, fantastic story. I like all the characters. It's con- huge congratulations. So be sure to leave a like and subscribe on the video, guys. We do this every Friday. A new video will be up. If you have recommendations of your own, maybe you found something you really like, let us know. We'd love to check them out. If you somehow submitted your own and haven't gotten them to us yet, let us know. Uh, sometimes the comments get stuck in the spam filter, but I do add those to the list. But then I can't respond to the comments. I don't know why. YouTube has bamboozled it. So sometimes the links work, sometimes it don't. But no, I do add it to the list. Thanks for watching. We'll see you guys next week with more Jump Suka. Have a good one, and we'll see you next time.